morning. Thank you, Ariane and uh, uh, Pat and your team. Thank you very much for everything you're doing to arrange this and uh, for bringing us all together. Uh, I want to extend greetings to my friends and colleagues who are here, some old friends like Sid Gutierrez, who I haven't seen in a long time. Sid and our classmates, so we're about the same age. But uh, uh, Koichi, who I haven't seen in a while except for his pictures in space. Great to see you here. And Pam and, and uh, Roman and others uh, who are here. Box, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, Pat, you've brought together a, a good group of folks, and I think it's going to be an interesting couple of days. Um, I think Pat also has a very large New Mexico shepherd's crook that she's going to use if I run over my time, so I'm going to keep moving as fast as I can. She warned me to be prompt, so I'll do that, and uh, if I can figure this out. Um, is my first slide up? I have it here. Can you all see this? Oh, now you got it. Okay, good. Um, uh, I am going to talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, with the commercial cargo uh, resupply service. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the company, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, where I think we are uh, in aerospace and, uh, and in the space industry specifically. Um, in 2005, uh, as many of you know, NASA was given the task of stimulating commercial enterprise in space. Uh, a number of companies responded, uh, a number was for selected for different things, and we were lucky along with the, not lucky, we worked really hard for it. Uh, we were fortunate to be selected along with SpaceX to uh, execute the COTS program, which was a Space Act agreement, and then following that, the uh, cargo resupply service to uh, deliver cargo to the International Space Station. Uh, in less than five years, Orbital deliver, uh, developed the Antares rocket uh, under our own IRAD, and deliver the Cygnus, or develop the Cygnus spacecraft in conjunction with NASA under the Space Act Agreement. Um, we are uh, currently preparing to go back to flight. Uh, as many of you know, we had a mishap at Wallops uh, almost a year ago. Uh, we had came up with a return to flight plan within uh, a week or so. Uh, NASA thought it was a great idea, and so we're going to go back to, uh, to launching out of Wallops next spring. Uh, the pictures you see here, of course, are the Antares um, fueling liftoff and then the Cygnus rendezvous with, with ISS a little over a year ago. Um, the services we provide to the ISS, of course, are cargo up and cargo down. Uh, the cargo up, of course, is uh, a real hit with the crew. On our first mission, uh, which was named after G. David Lowe, uh, we delivered a really large supply of M&Ms to the crew, and having been there, I know how valuable chocolate is and uh, how prized, and so we had a lot of smiling crew members once that was delivered, and uh, Karen was happy to get some of her uh, special spices. Um, Luca did a great job uh, of uh, capturing that mission, and, uh, and we were able to deliver 700 kilograms uh, successfully. Orb 1, uh, uh, almost a ton and a half, and then Orb 2, over a ton and a half, uh, were delivered in uh, 2013, and, uh, sorry, 2014. And then, of course, Orb 3 was the mission that uh, was lost at, at Wallops. But we've delivered over eight tons of cargo to the station and uh, taken away about the same amount, and uh, we're getting ready to, to deliver again. The uh, return to flight plan will deliver cargo again in December aboard an uh, Atlas rocket, and uh, thanks to the ULA folks for the great work of, of integrating that and working with us to, uh, to continue to deliver to the ISS. One of the best things I saw after the accident was that a number of companies came forward offering to help us get back to flight. Everyone understands the, important of the importance of the ISS. Everyone understands the importance of keeping the, uh, the crew on board there and keeping them fed and clothed and keep the experiments going, and everyone wanted to see it continued. And um, we worked out a, a, a very good arrangement with ULA to fly the Cygnus twice, once in December the 3rd coming up and uh, once next March. And then we'll pick up with flights out of Wallops next May, approximately. Uh, we'll do a test firing early in the year with our new um, RD-181 engines, which are currently in production. We've had four of them uh, delivered already, and uh, two of them have in been integrated into the uh, first stage. Um, Cygnus is designed to be compatible with multiple launch vehicles, um, and we understand that it's important to keep this cargo going. We feel for every company that's had failures, and many uh, in this room have had failures of one type or another. Obviously, a lot of sympathy for uh, SpaceX and their recent failure, for um, uh, Virgin Galactic and, and uh, uh, the Spaceship 2 accident, and all the people who have dealt with the challenges of flying in space. Um, the preparations continue at the Cape. Uh, we've delivered the pressurized cargo module. The service module will leave next week from Dulles. 
Uh, we have to bypass the flooded areas in South Carolina, so it's going to take a little bit longer to get there than we had planned. Right, Frank? But we'll make it, and we'll integrate the, the uh, two spacecraft. Um, and so we'll continue delivering uh, cargo on a commercial basis to the crew. Uh, you can see crew members in the, in the uh, photos there, including Luca, who grabbed the first, uh, first Cygnus to arrive. Uh, we brought, by the way, we also brought uh, Luca a little bit of surprise up there. You may remember he did the EVA where they had the water uh, leaking into his helmet and, and he was having a hard time seeing and breathing. Uh, we took him a snorkel up there, which uh, he, uh, uh, he showed off quite a bit on, on video. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, the ISS is enabling commercialization in LEO. There are other things going on. Uh, commercial communications, of course, are a major factor in GEO and LEO. Uh, but with the extension of the ISS, we have nine more years to accomplish the goal of developing more of a commercial market uh, for human spaceflight in LEO. And human spaceflight beyond LEO will require uh, technology demonstrations and, and uh, systems development. And we think that commercial industry can participate that in, in that in a large way. The government, of course, will have to be a significant partner in that. We need the right legislation and policies in place, uh, continued simplification of ITAR and uh, export restrictions. Funding, of course, is a critical part of it. As Cinda said, you've got to have the money in order to go from your large fortune to your small fortune, but you still need to get some income to, to keep the, uh, uh, the programs going. Protection of intellectual property generated through commercial activities is going to be an important factor, too. And then, of course, the agreements for commercial transportation and how do we use NASA astronauts as well as uh, industry astronauts in moving forward. Um, the roadmap that we see uh, will include commercial transportation services for both cargo and crew. Uh, we can augment both NASA and the National Lab, uh, the CASIS efforts uh, through these, um, uh, these endeavors, and then augment, augment the ISS laboratory with commercially owned and operated equipment. Uh, we think that a complete commercial module could eventually be launched to the station, and, and you could focus on commercial development of, of business in space and maybe possibly a free fire with uh, uh, commercial um, activities going on. This has been dreams of people for a long time. I remember when Max Vijay and Joe Allen were spelling, selling space industries and wanted to fly a free flyer uh, to do that in space back in the 1980s. Um, it's been a long time. In coming, but I think we're getting closer and closer to that capability. Um, the ISS could transition from a government-operated facility to government-owned and contractor-operated, as many laboratories around the country do. That would be a major shift, but it could be done. And the industry, of course, is going to have to, to take some chances in order to make that happen. There are a number of commercial contractors, domestically and internationally, who could and would like to operate the ISS or another space station. Of course, NASA will continue to have access for specific activities, uh, for training of the astronauts, and for preparation for longer-term uh, space travel and longer-distance space travel. But you could manage that with a commercial operator. A large subset of the total research uh, could be performed by commercial astronauts in the future. And so I think that even looking at how we continue space station beyond the, the plan 2024 will require looking at enhancement or replacement of ISS elements using commercially developed uh, launch vehicles or commercially developed uh, modules in order to keep it going. My nightmare is that somebody actually thinks that the space station will stop in space, put on the brakes in 2024 and come back in. That's not going to happen. This is a big structure up there. And if we are dumb enough to let it go in 2024, then we probably deserve uh, the, the reputation our generation will get. The generation beyond us, though, is going to count us uh, on us keeping it going because they're not going to get to the moon and Mars if we stop flying in humans in space. So we need space station to continue beyond whatever its current life is. That current life is a policy. It's not necessarily the, the capability of the station. Um, we think that NASA can uh, help invigorate the commercial LEO market through restructuring the requirements, continuing to streamline processes. And by the way, uh, the CRS has been a, 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 um, a true hallmark of how government commercial integration can occur and cooperation can, can uh, maximize the use of resources and, and minimize the, the uh, bureaucracy that, that we typically have in, in some of these endeavors. Uh, there could be funding opportunities to prime the pump. Uh, you need anchor tenants, of course, and the COTS model, as I said, is a good one. And you could accommodate commercial utilization outside of the national lab. 
Uh, we're still waiting on that killer app. Who's going to come up with the, the factory in space that is so good and produces such a valuable product that everybody wants to invest in it? We're just not quite there yet. People have been trying for a long time, but I think it's coming. Someone is going to figure out what we can do in space better than anywhere else, and we have to do things in space. You know, it's like the gold rush to California or silver here. You're going to have to find the thing that people really, really want, and then they're going to have to commercialize it. Um, it can be applied beyond SS, ISS, onto Mars and everywhere in between, and there's lots of opportunities for uh, commercialization. Um, I'm going to talk for a minute now about Hollywood, which, uh, uh, as we know, uh, is a great source of inspiration for many people. Um, uh, when Top Gun came out, I already thought I was a pretty hot pilot until I saw Tom Cruise. <laughs> Um, and so I started trying to emulate that, almost got me grounded. But, but, um, uh, but there were a lot of movies along the way that did inspire me, such as The Bridges of Toko Ri and, and uh, The X-15 Story and, and others that came along. The best one I ever saw was nonfiction, though, and that was the Apollo 11 landing, which really inspired me to do what I've been doing. I think it's very important that we show images like this to the next generation and to even our generation to remind us of why we do what we do. Um, there's a lot of good movies that have been out there. Um, I thought that I knew a lot about robotics and remote control after I saw Ender's Game, for example, uh, and I was ready to send people to other galaxies. Um, but the one that, of course, just came out and has everybody talking is The Martian. Um, the one just prior to that was Gravity. Two totally different movies in my mind. Gravity was a disaster movie. In fact, it was every nightmare I ever had in space occurring about every minute. I was a kind of a puddle by the time the movie was over. Marsh, the Martian was like a lot of other space movies. It was solving problems. It was doing what Konstantin Tsiolkovsky and Robert Goddard did uh, over 100 years ago in trying to solve the problem of getting off the Earth, overcoming gravity, and getting us to where we want to go. Maybe not where we need to go, though some of us would differ, but where we want to go, which is into space. We want to get off this planet. We want to colonize other planets. We want to make it accessible to lots of people. The Martian movie, Mark had to solve a lot of problems. He did it like any typical aerospace engineer. He just kept working. And even when he almost blew himself up, he didn't give up. How many of you have either figuratively or literally almost blown yourself up and, yeah, thanks, Wayne. And, <laughs> and gone back to work. A lot of us have dealt with failures of one sort or another, but we don't give up. The other thing is, how many of you have tried to leave aerospace unsuccessfully? Many, right? We all know people who've tried to get out of the business. They always come back. There is nothing like it. We are trying to solve a problem that people don't really understand very well, and that's what is the force of gravity, and why can't we overcome it? Why does it take so much energy to do that? We're going to keep doing it. We're going to keep putting people in things and hardware and products in space because that's what we know has to be a part of our future. You're going to hear a lot more about that this week. Uh, a lot of the students aren't here yet, but I'm really looking forward to them hearing what everybody here has to say and helping inspire them to do what we haven't done yet, which is completely overcome gravity and make space accessible to everybody. The Martian, I thought, was a very inspirational movie. It followed the book as close as you can in a two-hour movie. In the end, it was a success. And I do not begrudge NASA taking advantage of that and partnering with them and saying, here, this is what we can do in the future, because we can. NASA, aerospace industry, all the companies in here, all the organizations represented, all the ideas that are here, that's what we're all about, solving those problems. Whether they're a big failure or a little idea someone has that has to be solved, that's what we do. You cannot give up. In fact, I'll finish by a quote from another very famous inspirational space movie that um, um, I wanted to emulate a lot, but I've decided it wasn't quite up my alley. But that's Galaxy Quest. <laughs> Actually, I've been to a lot of those conferences where they wanted autographs, but never give up, never surrender. That's my advice to you. Never give up, never surrender. 
and keep getting out there, signing the autographs, talking to the kids, and advertising what we do. Tell your next door neighbors what we do, what you do, and why it's exciting. Keep advertising your life because it's important to the future of their world and our grandchildren. So thank you very much.